<sighs> Hannah, Hannah, Hannah. All right. Matthew chapter 5. Is there scripture up there? All right. We're at Beatitude number 4, Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look at verse number 6 tonight for our focus. You can follow along on the screen with me if you'd like to. Seeing the multitudes, he went to the mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Again, Jesus is teaching his disciples. He's focusing on them and teaching them about blessedness, about spiritual well-being, about spiritual health, being spiritually healthy. And in the first three Beatitudes, we notice that the natural man can find no happiness or blessedness or spiritual blessing. The natural man can't understand spiritual poverty. The natural man cannot understand what it means to mourn. The natural man can't understand how meekness is a blessing. It takes the spiritual man to see how these Beatitudes work. Disciples or learners or students can learn because these are spiritual lessons to be spiritually healthy, spiritually blessed, spiritually healthy. Now the first two Beatitudes we looked at, blessed are they that are poor in spirit and blessed are they that mourn, are more outward issues. Blessed are the meek is more of an inward attitude that expresses itself outwardly. But tonight we come to one that is very, very interesting. The desire of the one who has a spirit of poverty, the desire of the one who's mourning for sin, the desires of the one who are meek, what is it that they seek? What is it that a spiritually impoverished person needs? What is it that a spiritually broken, mournful person needs? What is it that a spiritually, genuinely meek person needs in order to be obedient, to be healthy? They need righteousness. Notice the text, verse 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. You ever think about being hungry? And I told Carl tonight I was going to bring everybody a little Debbie and I was going to pass them out when I started preaching and say, the only condition about this message is you can't eat the Little Debbie. You can't eat the Twinkie or the cookie or whatever I was going to give you. You just got to hold it so everybody else can look around at your Twinkie all night. Little brownies, cookies. I mean, just thinking about maybe a donut over at JC. You know, they're making new donuts at JC. They're, they're uh, white ice donuts and they're putting Fruit Loops on them. Doesn't that sound good? No, I didn't buy any, though. I was tempted, but I didn't buy any. I'm trying to cut back. And then there are other ones, they got pretzels. They put pretzels on the white icing. And then others, they've made s'mores with marshmallows and graham cracker crumbs and some chocolate chunks on a donut. I'm telling you, man, it just looks good. I just stand there at the glass, and my mouth just starts to water. <clears throat> I'm doing good, though. I'm cutting back. Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. I'd venture to say most of us in here tonight have never gone hungry for too long. Now, you might find this hard to believe, but over in the other building, there are these little personages, and when they're hungry, they pitch a royal fit until you feed them. I mean to tell you, those little things can cry and scream and kick. And with parental permission, our nursery workers shove a bottle in their mouth. And they start drinking that milk and they calm right down. I've been at some eating establishments with some of you all and I've watched you eat. You pretty much behave the same way until you get that plate of food. I, I've seen it. I've seen some people that I thought, wow, you need to eat regular. I understand that. There is a profound hunger that cannot be satisfied by a snack. You ever think about that? When you're hungry, what do you need? 
when you're thirsty, what is it you need? You see, I think we need to come to the place where this longing for righteousness is, is reminded that this passion is real, just like hunger and thirst are real. The passion is natural, just like eating and drinking are natural things for healthy people. This passion is intense. You wake up hungry, it's pretty intense, isn't it? How many of y'all have ever hurt yourselves trying to get to some food? I mean, it's just a natural instinct, man. We just go for it. How many of y'all ever stepped in front of a little old lady at a buffet line? Uh, that wasn't a good idea, was it? I mean, I'm telling you, it's, it's not a good idea. Or stepped in front of a young man at a buffet line. That's not a smart idea. You know, passion can also be painful it's, if it's really hunger and thirsty. It can be a determining force in your life if you're hungry or thirsty. The passion can be a sign of health, however, because it's a good thing to eat and drink. What is it that a hungry person needs? Food. What is it a thirsty person needs? Water. You ever think about that? I mean, it's, it's an incredible, simple reality. If you're hungry, you need food. If you're thirsty, you need a drink. Now, Debbie and I on occasion watched uh, Survivor, and a couple weeks ago they had this older guy on there, and he won one of those uh, rewards where he got to go eat. And unwisely, after 30-some days of not eating well, he scarfed down a steak and a bunch of other foods, and it, it messed with him in a major way. And it hurt him bad. He ate too much of the wrong stuff too quick. And he basically had to get out of the show because he was hurt by eating the wrong stuff the wrong way. Isn't that interesting? I told the children this morning that yesterday I ate too much at lunch. I just did. Uh, we were eating at a Mexican place there with uh, Zach and Laura. Robin was with him. Zach's mom was there taking care of the baby. And we all went to this Mexican place there outside of uh, Spring Hill, Tennessee, if it matters to you all. And we were sitting there and, and man, their salsa was so good. And my food was so good. And Debbie's food was so good. <laughs> I just, man, I, I, I was going to be driving for four hours. And I know better. Sure enough, man, got in the car sitting there and I started just indigestion like you wouldn't believe. And I thought, Lord, I know better. Like I told the kids this morning, it's my own fault. I'm so blessed that I could overeat. And I was, and so, food was so good and so abundant. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. When you meet somebody, you soon, you soon learn what their driving passion is. Now, I suspect you could talk to somebody tonight that you don't know real well. If I said, take six, eight minutes and talk to this person, you're going to glean pretty quickly what's important to them, aren't you? Uh, their children, their grandchildren, uh, maybe their job, uh, maybe uh, music, or maybe sports, or maybe you know donuts. I'm not sure what their passions are. But we glean them fairly quickly, don't we? Uh, what do you hunger and thirst after? You know, we live in a world today where people thirst and hunger after power. Um, so far, someone told me that over $350 million have been spent on an election for a job that pays less than half a million dollars a year. A combined $350 million to get elected to a position that pays less than half a million a year. Why would people do that? Now, collectively, they spent that money. Uh, one candidate the, the, has spent over 180 some million dollars on her campaign, and uh, the presumptive nominee of the other party spent less than 60 million dollars, 180 and 60, for a job that pays less than half a million dollars a year. Why? People hunger and thirst after the power, the fame, the position. You know, we live in a world where people hunger after success. Um, if you took a poll, you would discover that the greatest threat to financial security among my generation is student loans. Their own and that of their children and grandchildren. You know why? Because we link success with attending college. And student loan debt is off the chart because we want successful children and grandchildren. 
the number one, matter of fact, I heard a, a financial planner the other day on the radio. He said at least a third of his, uh, at least a third of his clients have student loan debt of their grandchildren. I thought, where were my parents when my kids wanted to go to school? That's, I, I, I didn't do something right, you know. What is it you're hungry for? What is it at the end of the day that you say, I wish I had done blank today? What are you hungry for? It's a good reminder, Jesus said, that in this day and culture that we really, uh, that, he, that that culture understood what it meant to be hungry and thirsty. Now, with the possible exception of, of, of your time in the camp, I would suspect that no one in our crowd tonight has ever been starving. Now, I know my kids said it all the time. I'm starving, Dad. No, no, you're not. And I venture to say most of us in here have never, ever truly been starving. Now, we've been hungry. But we've not been hungry to the place that it affected us in a major way attitudinally. Or we've not been hungry for days. Oh, Pastor, I went on a two-day fast one time. About killed me. I get you. But in Jesus' day and age, they understood what it meant to be hungry. What do you drink when the water system gets polluted? What do you drink if the well goes dry? Well, in our society, we got more water filters than we can imagine. Um, city of Cincinnati, when I was there several years ago, put in a new filtration system on the Cincinnati system coming out of the Ohio River. Now, you couldn't pay me to swim in the Ohio River, but they drink it. They filter it and they filter it. And then the sewage department dumps it back into the Ohio River. Isn't that exciting? And it goes to Louisville's drinking water. That's the exciting part. But the, you know, I'll use it work in Louisville, sorry. But the mayor of Cincinnati, they were so proud of their new filtration system at the sewage plant that the mayor of the city, they flipped a switch on the back of the sewage. They opened up a garden hose and they filled a glass of water that they were dumping back into the Ohio River. And he took a big old drink out of it to prove that what was going back into the river was cleaner than what they pulled out. That man is either very, very brave or they set up something in that hose to make sure it was clean water. We filter water like crazy. They didn't have any of that in Jesus' day. We can run to a grocery store where there are preservatives keeping food fresh and there's refrigeration and freezers that are keeping food from spoiling. They didn't have that in Jesus' day. They could salt the meat. They could bury it. There was truly problems with hunger and starvation and thirsting. In our society today, we just kind of don't understand that. We don't have any food, hey, go buy some. If it's been a bad harvest, well, we'll still go buy some. We don't understand the magnitude of hungering and thirsting. Spurgeon said it this way, It is not enough for me to know that my sin is forgiven. I have a fountain of sin within me, and the bitter waters continue to flow from it. Oh, that my nature could be changed so that I, the lover of sin, could be made a lover of that which is good, that I, now full of evil, could become full of holiness. Do I hunger and thirst after righteousness? Or do I hunger and thirst after my own goals? Do I hunger and thirst for God's best? Or do I hunger and thirst to get my own way? That's a powerful question, isn't it? How does this hunger and thirsting express itself? What does it mean when you long after a righteous nature? What does it mean that you want to be sanctified, to be made more holy? What does it mean that you want to continue in God's righteousness? What does it mean that you long to see the righteousness of God promoted in our society? It's interesting, isn't it? What is it that we promote? Now, in our society today, we all wear T-shirts with stuff on it, right? Indiana. What does it say? Air Apostle. It's a store, right? Yeah, I'm good. What's your Superman? Is that really? It's kind of convoluted in there, isn't it? We all wear shirts that advertise things. VBS right around the corner. What's your St. Louis 2016 Silver Creek Middle School? All right. Jerry, you're wearing a shirt from somewhere. What does that say? Trees? Palm trees. Palm trees. Bought it at some beach somewhere, huh? Probably. 
We advertise things. Carl, what do you advertise in there? A salty dog cafe Hilton Head. Is that any good? All right. If you like seafood, not a bad option. You're advertising your work. Got called into work on Sunday afternoon. We all advertise things all the time, don't we? Is that a nasty logo from the St. Louis Cardinals on that tie? Oh, my gracious. Here's my question. What do we truly advertise? What do we promote? What do we promote? What is it that we're a billboard for? Jessica, does she match you? You're comparing t-shirts back there. Has she got something on hers? No? Okay. Has that hat got anything on it other than bedazzling stuff? It's very nice looking. And very well color coordinated. Listen to me. We all promote something by what we do and say and how we live. There's a running joke between those hideous people that play a best baseball game out of St. Louis and the beloved team from Cincinnati. We understand the difference. We understand that there's some universities in this region, Indiana, Louisville, Kentucky, IUS. We all fight over which is the better college. Basketball season, there are people that have to sit in three different sections in our church, right? Because we're, we're so, you know, the UK's over here, UVL's in the middle, IU's over there. We, we have to divide ourselves sometimes. What is it that we promote? Do we promote the righteousness of God? Do we promote it on Sunday morning when we come to church? Do we promote it on Tuesday in the middle of the day? Do we promote it on Friday night? Are we consistent? Because somebody who's hungry is always consistently looking for food. Somebody who's thirsty is always consistently needing and wanting and desiring a drink. Jesus turns the corner on his disciples. He says, you know, I've talked to you about being poor in spirit because that's the kingdom of heaven. I've talked to you about mourning over your sin because you can be comforted. I've talked to you about being meek because I've called you to inherit all that I have. But spiritually healthy people must get to the place where they hunger and thirst after that which only the righteous of God fulfills. And when that happens, we find ourselves filled. What is it a hungry person wants to be? Filled with food. Yeah, okay. Next time you get really hungry, eat one bite of food. It's like eating one potato chip. It's impossible, isn't it? I mean, I... I, I uh, Opened a bag of barbecue chips this afternoon, those baked grilled ones, whatever they were. Not the little one, the big one. Debbie bought this little bag at the IGA at Bowling Green. I didn't open that one. This was one we bought at JC. And I thought, I just need a couple bites. Half a bag later, I'm going, what am I doing here? Y'all know what I'm talking about? What is it that a hungry person does? They eat till they're full. Now, in our society, we often eat till we're well past full. We always try to tell our kids, stop when you're full. I have to remind myself that all the time, stop when you're full. What does it mean to be filled with food? Well, man. It means you loosen the belt, you belch a little bit, and you go, oh, that was good. Is that what it means? No, it means you don't have to worry about starving today, right? It means that God has provided a blessing food-wise for today. What does it mean to be filled when you're thirsty? What does it mean to be satisfied with drink? And I, of course, am referring to drinks you should be drinking, healthy things for you. I, I think so often we need a reminder that what does it mean to be filled? It means that God has met our needs. Do we lack confidence in God when we don't expect Him to fill our needs. Jesus is saying, hey, you've got to be poor in the Spirit to join my kingdom. You've got to come to the place where you recognize you're lost without me. 
uh, verse, the second ver uh, verse and forth there. Blessed are they which mourn. You've got to come to the place where you're broken by your sins so you can be comforted by the Holy Spirit of God, the great comforter. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the blessing. Listen, you've got to get to the place where you are strength that is controlled. You are brokenness that's not bitter. You've got to get to the place where you're demonstrating a, the, the control over who you are under the leadership of God because the land that I'm going to forgive you that you can possess is yours. But spiritually healthy people are passionate about being righteous. Now, I um, probably shouldn't do this, but Ariana, can you answer a question for me tonight, honey? Will you try? Have you eaten yet today? Did you eat breakfast? Did you eat lunch? Did you eat before you came to church tonight? You'll eat dinner after church? Okay. So if you eat three square meals today, you probably don't have to eat again until what, next Saturday, next Sunday? No? You'll eat again this week? So if you eat three meals today, three meals and probably a snack, right? Did you eat a snack this afternoon? Some crackers, donut or two, something like that? Ice cream? Man, you're spoiled rotten, aren't you? Three meals and ice cream? So you probably won't eat it again until Wednesday night's church supper dinner, right? When, when, when will you be hungry again? Tomorrow morning? Really? You'll get up at 6 o'clock in the morning and get your school clothes on and you'll say, Mother dear, may you please present me with the morning meal? 6.45, okay. <laughs> so you'll get up at 6.45, you'll get your school clothes on and you'll say, Mother dear, would you please present the morning meal? Now, is your mom going to make you some food in the morning? Your dad or somebody? So you're telling me that you get filled today and you're still hungry tomorrow? Oh. Is there a spiritual lesson in that, you think? Now, if you read your Bible today, do you need to read your Bible tomorrow? You know, today's Bible reading is probably good enough to hold you over. No, no, I'm being facetious, right? If you prayed today, surely praying on Sunday is enough. Okay, I'm being facetious. If you're listening on tape or something, don't go crazy on me. When was the last time you were hungry for righteousness? You see, what fills you today is just enough for today. You remember when Moses was leading the children through the land a promise they were going through the desert so they could get to the promised land and, and and God sent down manna from heaven and I mean it was a wonderful blessing wasn't it can you imagine the first time manna from heaven fell and they're like hey this stuff's edible man this is great and they start eating that stuff and man they just they just pigged out on it and they and some brilliant young lady said hey I'm taking a bag of this stuff home for tomorrow but the Bible tells us that it soured but every day they had to gather enough for the day now, on, on the day before the Sabbath, they can gather in enough for the Sabbath. You see what our problem is? We think because we've made a decision for Christ and we're born again, we think because we go to church on Sunday and a Sunday night and Wednesday night and, and occasionally we go out to grow and, you know, we get involved and we help with things and we give to missions and we give to uh, camp trips and we support the church in many different various facets that we're righteous. But it must be enough for today. I got to tell you something, Ari, I'm with you. I've had, I had a brownie for breakfast. Lindsay Hartledge brought snacks to Sunday school today because it was her birthday week. I had a brownie and a Dr. Pepper for breakfast. We, uh, we had a, a $5, five buck lunch at Dairy Queen after church this morning. And I ate the chicken wraps and the fries and half the Sunday, cutting back. I just ate half the Sunday. What's wrong with y'all? And, and then I ate a uh, cheese sandwich about 4 o'clock. And I expect I'm going to eat something tonight because I eat Sundays are bad. I can't eat a big meal before I preach. And tomorrow morning, I'm going to get up and I'm going to need something for tomorrow, ain't I? And I'm going to need lunch tomorrow even though I ate lunch today. And I'm going to drink a can of soda tomorrow, even though I had one today. 
Am I hungering and thirsting after righteousness the way I hunger and thirst after food and drink? Perhaps we could substitute some synonyms. Now, I'm not suggesting we change the Word of God tonight, but let's try some synonyms. Y'all know what synonyms are? What's a synonym? Yeah. What school do you go to? All right, give me somebody that doesn't go to your school. What's a synonym? Synonyms are the same. Thank you. S is an S. All right. Synonyms are word that basically mean the same thing. And the educator over there is just, ooh, I can't believe she got that wrong. Okay. Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness. Not, not changing the context and certainly not changing the Bible, but what are some synonyms for righteousness? Maybe it would be good if we said, blessed are they which hunger and thirst after Jesus. Isn't he the alternate definition of righteousness? Do you hunger and thirst after Jesus? What if we said, blessed are they which hunger and thirst after holiness, godliness, Jesus. Now, here's the promise. For they shall be filled. Jesus promised. He promised. Spiritually healthy people which, which do hunger and thirst after him and the things of his kingdom and, and the righteousness and the holiness and the godliness, the, the things that are related to Jesus. Blessed are they which are hungry and thirsty after those things for they shall be filled. Now isn't it strange that this filling both satisfies us and keeps us wanting more. You ever been to a restaurant and you had a great experience? And you said, boy, if I get a chance, I'm going back to that restaurant. Uh, Debbie and I, uh, it's Friday night, we stopped at a place uh, north of Nashville. And uh, we've eaten there three or four times now. And every other time has been for lunch. We've had three marvelous luncheon experiences there. We got there Friday night, dinner time. More expensive, less food, didn't enjoy it as much. Kinda, kinda aggravated me actually. I mean, it, it wasn't our anniversary yet, but it was our anniversary trip. And I mean, I'm spending really good money to take her to this place and just wasn't what we wanted or remembered. I remember that restaurant filling us. It being incredible. I wanted more. That's the promise of Scripture. To be filled with Jesus, to be filled with righteousness, and is a daily renewable resource to all who believe. Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be. Now tonight, if you're not filled with Jesus, it may well be because you're not hungry for him. It may well be you've stopped craving him. You've stopped drinking it in. You've stopped yearning and thirsting and being hungry for him. Because the promise is here. Spiritually healthy, blessed are you who do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Here's the promise. For they shall be filled. I could very easily answer many people come by my office or call me pastor. I just don't feel filled with the spirit anymore. I don't feel like I'm doing as much for the kingdom as I used to. I don't feel as in tune with the things of God as I used to. I could just very easily say, because you've stopped being hungry for him and thirsty for him because he's promised to fill us. I am. Uh, I'm 
when I was a little boy. Nobody had to tell me where the refrigerator was. I knew where the refrigerator was. And I knew what I was allowed to eat out of the refrigerator and what I wasn't allowed to eat out of the refrigerator. I knew what to ask for before I was allowed to have it. And as I got older, I knew I was allowed to have more things, a little more freedom with taking food off the shelves, making little snacks here and there. I grazed between meals regularly and still ate my meals, you know. I mean, I was fine. I was a healthy young man. I knew, I knew there was plenty. We never went hungry. And friends, we know, we know how to be filled. We know where the Word of God is that teaches and shapes us. Too often we find ourselves empty. Are you filled tonight? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me and our music team is going to come in just a moment. I want to extend a time of invitation. You see, I believe tonight that you're not here by accident, so it's important that I preach my heart out and I tell you exactly what the Lord's laid on my heart to share. And, and I believe somebody here tonight has struggled with this principle or perhaps needed the encouragement tonight that this principle brings. But the promise is here that you shall, you shall be filled not just a little bit satisfied. But when we hunger and thirst after Jesus and his kingdom and his righteousness, we are filled. And that's good news, isn't it? So tonight, what are you craving? And if tonight you're not 100% sure you've ever come to that place in your life where you trusted Christ as your personal Savior, if you're not certain that you've ever gone through the idea of being poor in spirit to receive the kingdom of God or mourning over your sins so that the Holy Spirit of God can comfort you, or you've ever experienced what it truly means to be meek in the power of God, you'll never understand what it means to hunger and thirst after His righteousness. So tonight I simply want to ask you, are you filled? And if not, the answer is because you're not craving him. You're not hungering for him. For he's promised to fill us. Now, Father, it's in the name of Jesus that I thank you for the privilege of sharing your word. Lord, we know where the resources are to meet our every need. Remind us to seek you. Father, I pray that our people will crave you, will hunger and thirst after you. Oh God, do what only you can do in the hearts and lives of your people. Change us, Lord. Help us to find only satisfaction in you. Now tonight, if there's a struggle in your heart, you're seeking the wrong things. You're craving the wrong things. You're being filled with the wrong things. Maybe you need to repent of that. And maybe you need to ask God to help you be hungry and thirsty for his righteousness. For he's promised. And he cannot lie. He's promised. If we'll hunger and thirst after his righteousness, we shall be filled.